morning. Uh, welcome to the ASC's 2023 Corporate Finance uh, Corporate Disclosure Information Session. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I, my name is Denise Weirs. I'm the Director of the Corporate uh, Finance Division here at the Alberta Securities Commission. Um, in response to feedback that we heard from last year's event, uh, this year we have, of course, as you've noticed, um, uh, proceeded with another webinar event, um, and that seemed to be uh, most popular with uh, those who responded last year. Um, also, in response to the feedback, last year we split the event up into two different uh, sessions. So today um, you will hear from uh, our corporate finance, um, corporate disclosure and financial analysis team, and uh, they'll be reporting on the results of their reviews of uh, prospectuses and continuous disclosure documents. You'll also hear a regulatory update from um, and Anthony Potter, the manager of that team, and regulatory updates from both our uh, CDAR Plus uh, department, uh, including a guest speaker, Helen uh, Walsh from the CSA's um, IT systems office, and an update from our innovation and finance uh, team as well. Um, next week, on Tuesday, uh, January 24th, uh, we'll be uh, hosting the Energy Matters uh, information session. So if you are interested in that and haven't signed up, please do so. It will include the results of the reviews of our energy group, of the uh, reserves and resources disclosure required under National Instrument 51101. Um, uh, with uh, issuers with oil and gas activities, as well as uh, their reviews of some sustainability disclosure and capital market stats uh, for those in the energy sector. In the energy sector, so two parts um, to the session today, and then uh, and next week if you're interested in that. In addition to um, our disclosure review sessions that we annually hold, uh, we also intend to be ho hosting webinars on each significant new regulatory development in the corporate finance space. So uh, we'll be holding a couple of those uh, in the upcoming months, uh, one scheduled in uh, February uh, for uh, an overview of the new listed issuer financing exemption, the prospectus exemption, as well as a deeper dive on the self-certified investor exemption that you'll hear a bit about today. And then in March, we'll have another session on uh, the new offering memorandum uh, exemption changes. Um, but we're very interested in hearing from you. If there's areas of particular interest to you, um, please let us know, and we will try to uh, address that. Um, and just a reminder that we also have other resources available on our website that may be of assistance to you, uh, prior presentations. Um, for example, last year's discussion of non-GAAP financial measures, those are available on our website under events and presentations. Uh, there's other resources. Uh, there's an issuer toolkit section on our website that has more uh, resources from our chief accountant's office on non-GAAP financial measures. And in our small business section, more resources on um, various areas, particularly capital raising um, using prospectus exemptions. So um, just want to highlight those for you. Um, if you, uh, for today's event, um, we'll have... Uh, uh, we'll go through the first three sessions here uh, from our securities analysis team. Uh, that's our team of uh, largely uh, CPAs. Uh, then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, we'll have a short break. I think it's five minutes. Uh, and then we'll have those regulatory updates. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A function. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat. I think the chat is disabled, but um, we'll be monitoring the Q&A. And then we'll uh, take the questions. So the we'll have a take all the questions from the first uh, three sessions together, and if, then the others uh, you they'll be taking them sort of throughout the presentation. Uh, if you are interested in uh, this session being uh, used for continuing professional development hours, that is uh, available. There will be two code words that will appear on your screen. Uh, during the Q&A session. So write those down. Uh, at the end of the uh, event, there will be a survey and you enter the two code words into the survey. Um, 
And those code words, uh, each one will uh, be make you eligible for one hour of CPD credits. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Chelsea uh, Holdsworth, uh, Jennifer Pearson, and Chris Andrews from our securities analyst team. And I hope you will find their presentations uh, interesting and helpful. Thanks, and we'll see you shortly. Hi, I'm Chelsea Holdsworth, and I'm a securities analyst in the corporate finance group. I've been at the ASC for five and a half years, and the majority of my time has been spent reviewing continuous disclosure documents and prospectus filings. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pearson, and I'm also a securities analyst in the corporate finance group. I worked as a securities analyst with the ASC in the past and rejoined about a year ago. And we're happy to have you back. Thanks, Chelsea. As analysts, we have a few different jobs, but one of our main roles is to conduct continuous disclosure reviews also known as CD reviews. Today, we're going to share some insights into how we perform these reviews and how you can help drive the process so it runs efficiently. I'm going to let Jen kick things off. Thanks, Chelsea. First of all, the purpose of these reviews is to ensure compliance with the reporting requirements, but also to help reporting issuers understand their reporting obligations. Our goal is to help issuers improve completeness, quality, and timeliness of disclosures so that investors are provided with balanced, relevant, and reliable information. Our focus is on material information and issues that could impact an investor's decision to buy, sell, or hold. When we raise a comment seeking clarification of a particular issue, others may well have similar questions or concerns. Agreed. Getting a letter from us doesn't need to set off alarm bells. So Jen, if someone listening today has received a letter from us, they may be wondering, why did you pick us? Can you explain some of the reasons why an issuer may be chosen for a review? For sure. Um, there are a couple of ways that an issuer could be selected for a review. The first is that an issuer files a document with us that triggers the review. This could be a notice of intention to be short form eligible or a cease trade order revocation application. The second is a risk-based review in which an issuer is selected following a change in business or financial results, a material development is identified, or there are changes in market cap to name a few. Chelsea, do you want to describe the different types of reviews that we perform? Definitely. So there are a couple of different types of reviews that we perform that differ in scope and depth. In a full continuous disclosure review, our journey takes us through the issuer's recent disclosure record and, if need be, further back to understand how the business has developed. It's a comprehensive review that involves the analyst reading through the issuer's latest annual, interim, and financial statements and the related MD&As. We'll also review the annual information form, if an issuer has one, and the information circular. We review material change reports, news releases, and other filings that have been made in the last year. If business acquisition reports or technical reports have been filed, we, along with technical experts, will review those as well. Our review also scopes in voluntarily filed documents, such as corporate presentations on issuers' websites or other public disclosures made on social media. In an issue-oriented review, the route is typically shorter as an analyst is focused on the specific issue or document that's been filed or otherwise disclosed. So these could be specific to an issuer or related to a particular disclosure issue that the ASC or CSA is concerned about. These could be specific accounting, legal, or regulatory issues, or they could be related to an emerging issue or industry to assess compliance with new or amended rules that recently came into force. Right, like how we recently conducted a review of the application of National Instrument 52112, non-GAAP measures and other financial measures disclosure, which came into force on August 25th, 2021. In case our audience is interested, the results of that review are included in Staff Notice 51364. Yes, and how the eighth year of the CSA's review of disclosure regarding women on boards and in executive officer positions was released on October 27, 2022. In these types of reviews, we would only focus on the documents and the disclosures that apply to the issue at hand. 
Now that we've discussed how an issuer can be selected for a review and the types of reviews that could be initiated, let's provide a roadmap of what a continuous disclosure review looks like from our end. Would you like to start, Chelsea? Sure. So when I'm first assigned a review, I try to gain an understanding of the issuer and where their business is right now. This includes understanding who is involved, including management, executive officers, and directors. I also look through the disclosure documents to determine who the auditors are and if the issuer relies on any other experts. I try to gain an understanding as well of who the related parties are. I also then try to understand how the issuer generates revenue or their plans to generate revenue in the future, including when new products and services will be commercialized. In the case of issuers without significant revenue, I try to understand the status of the issuer's research and development activities. Next, I will determine how the business has been financed, where it operates, and the associated risks. During my initial review to gain an understanding of the big picture, I make note of any potential risks or issues that I see that I wanna review in more detail later. Once I have a big picture understanding of the issuer, then I begin to review documents in more detail for understanding and for compliance. That's my process too. Then I usually start with a detailed review of the executive officers and directors involved with the issuer. I first check to make sure that the audit committee composition is appropriate. Then I'll make sure that the corporate governance and audit committee disclosures are provided and complete. I also take a look at related parties. This is an area that's often included in our corporate finance report, as we frequently see deficiencies in this disclosure. For example, we often see issuers repeat the disclosure provided in their financial statements in their MDNA, but the MDNA actually requires some additional disclosure. Issuers often miss identifying the related party, indicating how they're related to the issuer and describing the business purpose of the transaction. Comprehensive disclosure of related party transactions is important because it highlights the influence that relationships can have over transactions and the financial results of an issuer. What's your usual next step? So next, I usually analyze whether the business makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I try to see if I could articulate to one or more of our coworkers what the issuer does based on the disclosures they provided. I also look at the issuer's financial statements to see if the results reported match the discussion of the business that's provided by the issuer in the MDNA. If I have questions, then I start to draft them in my letter. One of the issues that I do see during this step of my process is issuers in emerging industries using overly promotional language or excessive jargon. Yeah, I've been seeing that too. And if I don't readily understand the disclosure, I assume the average investor won't understand it either. So I make a note to include a comment in my letter to the issuer about defining terms or suggesting more plain language. Yeah, we've been seeing this a lot lately in emerging industries. So our colleague Chris is going to discuss some disclosure issues that are unique to those issuers in more detail later. Mm -hmm. The other thing I've seen with these type of businesses is that often they transition from other industries, such as mining or oil and gas. For sure. That brings me to my next step in the process, in which I look to see if there have been significant changes in the business, including acquisitions or changes in auditor. If these events have occurred, then I look to see if the required documents, such as the business acquisition report or the change in auditor documents have been filed. I also make sure that material contracts regarding significant events have been filed. I'll check to make sure that the impact of those contracts is also adequately disclosed in the documents and include comments in my letter if I'm not seeing these things. Yeah, for sure. I also look for other con contracts that appear to be important, but haven't been identified as material contracts. If they potentially contain material information that an investor would be interested in, they should be disclosed and filed on CDAR. Yeah, that's a good point. How do you usually identify contracts that could be material but haven't been filed on CDAR? Well, I'll usually do a review of news releases and material change reports to see if any material events have occurred that uh, may have a related agreement that hasn't been filed. If I see these types of issues, I'll include them in my comment letter. That's a good procedure to ensure the completeness of disclosure. A thought just came to me as you had mentioned material change reports. 
So I often find that material change reports aren't filed for events when they should have been. Material change reports are important documents because they help investors identify which news releases are considered by the issuer to be material. So as a reminder, an issuer must immediately file a news release when a material change occurs. And within 10 days of the event, they must file the material change report. I'll include a comment in my letter if I see events that seem material but didn't include a material change report. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I'd include that as an issue in my comment letter too. So what would you do next? So after I determine if there are any issues regarding changes in the issuer's business, I then consider how the issuer has financed their activities and determine whether any going concern issues have been adequately disclosed. So this goes back to our point about material contracts. If an issuer is mostly funded by debt, then I do look at their material contracts to see if the covenants that they're required to comply with have been calculated and disclosed. If I find the disclosure is unclear, then I will raise a comment to obtain more information. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Many of our comments are requests for more information. Oftentimes we need more information to be able to make a decision about whether additional disclosure is required or whether an issue is material. Not every comment will result in changes to the disclosure documents. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. it's, that's why it's important to answer the questions that we've asked. Mm -hmm. We do try to draft our letters to ask specific questions so that we can make these decisions, which might not always be clear when you first receive our letter, for sure. So coming back to debt covenants, if there are any risks about having to repay debt or obtain financing, we would want to make sure that that has been adequately disclosed. In fact, that brings me to another important procedure that we perform, which is to review the risks that have been disclosed. Mm -hmm. I check to make sure that the risks are specific to the industry and the issuer, and that they're listed in order of importance. Yeah, and another issue I often see related to risk disclosure is issuers including excessive caveats or conditions that reduce the importance or relevance of the risk. Mm -hmm. In these cases, we may ask that such caveats or conditions be removed. Mm -hmm. I think we've made good progress on our journey of describing how we perform a continuous disclosure review. Where do we go from here? So once I feel like I have a good understanding of where the issuer is now, I ask myself, do I understand where the issuer is going? Mm -hmm. Yes, especially for those new issuers without significant revenue. Mm -hmm. It's important for investors to understand what their plans are, what the timeline looks like, and the associated costs to achieve their goals. Yeah, definitely. It is an area where we often raise comments, as the MD&A doesn't always provide sufficient detail about what management's plans are. As we mentioned before, Chris is going to go into more depth on disclosure best practices for issuers in emerging industries, so we'll leave that topic with him. Uh, back to my point about where issuers are going. We often see forward-looking information presented that provides investors with some insight into the issuer's expected future results. While this information is very useful to investors, a recurring deficiency we see is a lack of disclosure of the assumptions used in setting those expectations, and in some cases assumptions that don't appear to be reasonable. It's important for issuers to state the assumptions underlying that forward-looking information because with this in information, investors are able to assess whether they agree with the assumptions. Yeah, agreed. I've also seen issuers who don't outline the risk factors that could cause actual results to differ from forward-looking information. Providing issuer-specific risk factors allows investors to appreciate what events might impact the achievement of projected results. It's also really important that issuers provide updates to forward-looking information so investors are aware of events that have impacted results and how targets have changed. For instance, if an issuer disclosed in Q1 that sales for the year were expected to be $1 million, but at Q3, year-to-date sales are only $150,000, and there's been no disclosure about the 1 million in sales previously presented as forward-looking information. Investors are left wondering if the company still plans to achieve their target. Mm -hmm. um, are there are the majority of sales expected in the rest of the year? Or did some event occur that will prevent them from meeting their target? Mm -hmm. 
investors are relying on this information to help them make investment decisions. So it's very important that issuers provide updates to forward-looking information or withdraw it. In fact, issuers can attract liabilities for failing to do so. Yeah, and related to that, Jen, I've also seen cases where forward-looking information is exaggerated to the point that we may say the disclosures are overly promotional or even misleading. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'll often raise a comment asking the issuer to either provide documentation that supports their statements or ask them to remove the disclosure. We consider disclosures to be overly promotional when future plans or results are exaggerated to the point that the disclosure is not supportable or the assumptions are very elaborate. It's important to be realistic and provide balanced disclosures when providing forward-looking information. If disclosure is unbalanced, there is a real risk that it will be misleading and the issuer and its principals could be liable to investors for that misleading information. Yeah. Another area where issuers should exercise caution is the use of data or information from third party sources. So issuers are responsible for that disclosure if they include it, and it's important that it be relevant. I think the point that we're getting at is that we want issuers to provide relevant information to investors, but we need to ensure that the information presented is balanced, substantiated, referenced, and up to date. For sure. So going back to our roadmap, I think we're at the point in our review journey where we've compiled a list of issues. Jen, what do you do to finalize your letter? Okay, well, at this point, I would perform research on any technical areas that require additional disclosures, such as IFRS or the continuous disclosure form requirements. I might also consult with other analysts or securities lawyers in our group or with the Office of the Chief Accountant on major accounting or auditing issues. I'll also engage experts from our energy group or mining experts for issuers in those industries. The industry experts review specific disclosures required for those industries, such as the reserve report or mining reports in detail. And we'll discuss any additional comments they have to include in my letter. Then I look over all of the issues that I've noted throughout my review and consider materiality again. That's a good point. While there usually is only one name on the letter, often the issues included in the comment letter have been considered by more than one member of our group. Sure. So to summarize our journey, I think it's important that we tell the audience, every file is different, and the road to the final comment letter will depend on the specifics of the issuer, their industry, and their related risks. Yes, and while ideally we would like most of our comment letters to improve on an issuer's future disclosure, we often identify unfiled documents that are required to be filed immediately. There may also be times when disclosure, di disclosure deficiencies could be materially impacting an investor's decision-making process, in which case issuers may be requested to restate and refile documents. Yes, yeah, and with that, I believe we're at the end of our continuous disclosure review journey. So to wrap up today, Jen, mm -hmm. let's share some tips that will help people successfully navigate a continuous disclosure review if someone has received a letter from us. Sounds good. Um, a first quick tip is to involve your legal counsel, auditor, and any other advisors that may help you write your response as soon as you receive a letter from us. This will help you identify areas of concern early in the process. Mm -hmm. Subsequent to this, the best thing that you can do is answer the questions asked as completely as possible. As you can see from today's discussion, we endeavor to write our comments in a clear and concise manner. However, if the question isn't clear or if you have questions about what to include in the response, staff would be more than happy to answer any questions or concerns over the phone. Agreed. I have received calls from issuers before asking why certain questions have been asked because they don't believe the issue to be material. In certain instances, we may simply be asking for more information to be able to make that determination ourselves. So we're happy to have a conversation about it. A best practice that I have found is that if an issue is complicated to explain in writing, it's easier to have a conversation over the phone or in person and then formalize what we've discussed in the response letter afterwards. We usually ask for a response to our first letter within 10 business days, and then subsequent letters, we give five business days, as we expect there to be fewer issues requiring a response. 
However, when a request is made in advance of the due date, we can provide extensions if they're not unreasonable, because we want to ensure that the process is not causing undue burden. Yes, we're here to help facilitate the process and we want to make it as productive as possible. Our final message today is that we're here to help and we want to be proud of the disclosures of Alberta issuers. Well said, Jen. We would both like to thank everyone for listening to us today. Hopefully the insights that we've provided have helped you to understand the continuous disclosure review process. That's all the time that we've been given today, so we'll pass it over to Chris. Thank you, Chelsea and Jennifer. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Andrews. I am a securities analyst in the corporate finance group. I have been at the ASC for three years and participate on various CSA working groups and committees and also review continuous disclosure documents and prospectus filings. Today, I will be covering the topic of impairment reversals. Many issuers recorded impairment charges to their assets and cash generating units in prior years. For those who are not familiar with the accounting requirements, a cash generating unit is commonly referred to as a CGU, which is the smallest identifiable group of assets that generate cash inflows that are largely independent of cash inflows from other assets or group of assets. As commodity markets and operating conditions have improved, IFRS may permit a reversal of certain prior period impairment charges other than goodwill. Issuers, issuers are required to assess whether there is any indication that an impairment loss recognized in prior periods may no longer exist or may have decreased. If any such indication exists, an estimate of the recoverable amount is required to be made. International Accounting Standard 36 deals with impairment reversals. Paragraphs 19 to 57 of IAS 36 outline how to estimate the recoverable amount and applies to both assets and CGUs. When estimating the recoverable amount, issuers should reassess and reevaluate the reasonableness of, of the assumptions used to ensure they now reflect the asset or CGU's current outlook. Assumptions should represent management's best estimate of economic conditions and cash flow should align with the issuer's most recent budget and forecast. According to IAS 36, a previously recognized impairment loss can only be reversed if there has been a change in the estimates used to determine the recoverable amount, and this change is determined from the last impairment loss recognized. In regards to the recoverable amount, it is defined as the higher of an asset or CGU's fair value, less cost of disposal, and its value in use. Please note that the value in use is the expected future cash flows of the asset or CGU used in its current condition, which are discounted to present value using an appropriate discount rate. If an issuer had estimated the recoverable amount to be highest using value in use, and now determines that the fair value less cost of disposal methodology results in the asset or CGU's highest recoverable amount, this is considered a change in estimate that is contemplated when reversing an impairment charge. A change in the amount or timing of estimated future cash flows or in the discount rate under the value and use model, or a change in the estimate of the components of fair value less cost of disposal are examples of change in estimates that are also considered when reversing an impairment charge. Please refer to section 114 and 115 of IAS 36 for further details on change in estimate considerations when reversing an impairment loss. When an impairment loss has been reversed and recorded, Staff have found that the accompanying disclosure to support reversing the loss is often lacking and does not meet the disclosure requirements in paragraphs 126 to 132 of IAS 36. Specifically, we have noted instances when impairment charges are reversed, issuers have not disclosed adequate details about the events and circumstances which led to the impairment reversal, sensitivities to changes in discount rates, and segment disclosures when applicable. Other common disclosure deficiencies we encounter include when the fair value less cost of disposal is used is that the required IFRS 13 fair value disclosures are often omitted. And when value in use is used, the discount rate used in the previous estimate of the recoverable amount has not been provided. We would like to remind issuers that when impairment losses are reversed, they are required to provide the following disclosures by asset class. The amount of impairment losses and reversals of impairment losses recognized in profit or loss during the period, the amount of impairment losses and reversals of impairment losses on revalued assets recognized in other comprehensive income during the period, as well as qualitative disclosures to disclose the assumptions used to determine the recoverable amount, 
such as commodity prices, discount rates, abandonment and reclamation costs, and any changes to future development plans. Staff would like to highlight that when impairment losses are reversed, issuers are required to provide the following disclosure for the impacted asset or CGU, such as sufficient details on the events and circumstances that led to the recognition and reversal of the impairment loss, a description of the CGU or nature of the asset, and if the aggregation of assets for identifying the CGU has changed since the previous estimate of the recoverable amount. Issuers must also disclose whether the recoverable amount is its fair value less cost of disposal or its value in use. If fair value less cost of disposal is used to determine the recoverable amount, issuers must disclose the level of the fair value hierarchy within which the fair value measurement of the asset or CGU is categorized, including the accompanying disclosures required by IFRS 13. Please note that IFRS 13 defines fair value as the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants. It contains a fair value hierarchy that prioritizes the inputs to valuation techniques into three levels. The hierarchy prioritizes level one input, which are considered observable, such as a quoted price in an active market, versus level three inputs, which are not observable and require significant judgment and estimation by the issuer. If value and use is used to determine the recoverable amount, the disclosure must include the discount rate used in the current estimate and previous estimate of value and use, if any. The next topic we'll cover is emerging industries and new technologies. Alberta is home to several issuers that are developing new technologies and operate in emerging industries, such as clean tech, renewable energy, cryptocurrency and related technology, such as blockchain, agritech, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We understand that these issuers are eager to grow their business and want to obtain timely access to financing. However, we are also aware that these new industries and technologies can present novel risks and circumstances, including the accounting treatment for new arrangements and transactions and disclosure matters, such as the status of product and project development. We appreciate that being involved in a new or emerging industry can be exciting, and there's a lot of focus on the potential upside of the industry and technology. Regardless of whether you're in a new industry or a long established one, disclosure must be balanced. Staff are mindful when reviewing the disclosure for new industries and technologies, that they can also introduce unique circumstances, such as a change of business, a series of one or more acquisitions and possible restructuring transactions. These transactions may involve related parties. Additional disclosure requirements will apply. In addition, an issuer will need to provide disclosure about its business and strategy so investors can understand what the issuer's plans are and what it is trying to achieve. It is important to avoid industry jargon and technical terms that would not be easily understood by the average investor or to adequately explain and define those terms so that investors can understand them. It is also important that both the industry and issuer specific risk factors and uncertainties be fully and clearly disclosed so investors can evaluate their potential impact on the issuer when making an investment decision. Disclosure for issuers in emerging industries and developing new technologies should include the following. A detailed description of the issuer's products or services, clearly outlining its expected revenue streams and related costs. In some instances, we will see numerous references being made to the size of the issuer's industry and the issuer's potential market share. After considering where the issuer is in relation to its development plans, and after reviewing third-party source information, we may question the relevance of these disclosures. You can find more information regarding third-party source information in our most recent Corporate Finance Disclosure Report. Issuers are also required to provide the key terms of any material agreements that it has entered into so investors can understand their impacts. In emerging industries, this can often be a licensing agreement that establishes each party's rights with respect to certain intellectual property. If the issuer is developing innovative technologies, it should describe its developments plan, identify key milestones, and disclose the stage of its development relative to the plan. Expenditures to date and the estimated time and cost to reach the next milestones and eventually commercialization should also be provided. Reuse of proceeds disclosure is provided, such as in a prospectus. It is important that the disclosure be complete and that the issuer's resources be sufficient to accomplish the stated purpose. CSA Staff Notice 41307, concerns regarding an issuer's financial condition and the sufficiency of proceeds from a prospectus offering provides further guidance in this area. 
As a reminder, staff would like to highlight the risks and uncertainties to issuers in emerging industries often include the fact that issuers have a limited financial history and its market and customer base are likely unestablished and the technology itself may not yet be proven. Also, there's typically limited access to capital, unestablished supply chains, and lengthy and uncertain requirements for licenses and permits. It is also important to consider and identify any risks unique to the issuer, such as reliance on key personnel, the terms of the license agreement, or issues with respect to an intellectual property, if any. Risk factors should be presented for most of these serious and should not be minimized by excessive caveats or conditions. To conclude, staff would like to highlight a few practice tips. Make sure the disclosure is relevant. At times, we see a lot of outdated or non-relevant information, which can make it difficult for a reader to readily comprehend where the issue is today and their plans moving forward. As noted in today's presentation, when disclosure is unclear, staff may not be able to assess the materiality of the item being disclosed. And this can lead to a comment from staff seeking more information. When describing the business, provide sufficient disclosure written in plain language, which is understandable to someone outside of the issuer's industry. In certain instances, your disclosure may be the first time a reader is introduced to the industry. Issuers in emerging industries are developing new technologies, frequently have a number of milestones that need to be met. For example, a new facility needs to be completed or a certain process needs additional testing and potentially further refinement. It is very important that these milestones are clearly disclosed, along with the anticipated timeline and estimated cost. We also expect to see disclosure as to how the issue has progressed in achieving previously announced milestones. And of course, every emerging business requires funding. Your MD&A must include an analysis of your company's liquidity and ability to meet your company's planned growth or to fund development activities. When disclosed, the intended use of proceeds should be consistent with the issuer's milestones. And in our most recent corporate finance disclosure report, we included a section on use of proceeds disclosure to provide further guidance on this area. Moving to the last bullet, processes should be set up to monitor changes, for example, to regulations or licensing requirements. Issuers should be aware of the requirements regarding timely disclosure of material changes in your business and prohibitions against selective disclosure. National Policy 51201 Disclosure Standards provides guidance on disclosure practices. Also, be very mindful of the requirements regarding the filing of material change reports using Form 51102F3. Later in the presentation, we hear from members of our innovation and finance team who are focused on exploring ways to better facilitate access to capital for issuers in emerging sectors. If you have questions, we encourage you to reach out to us. We will now take time to answer any questions you may have. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, we're gonna take a few questions. Uh, the first question I see here is, um, let's uh, maybe send this to you, Jennifer. Um, what, the, que the question is, um, What's considered, what does staff consider to be a material change that uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, that requires the filing of a material change report and not just a news release? Um, you would be required to file a material change report um, when you have a material change. And a material change is a change in the business operations or capital of an issuer that would reasonably be expected to have a significant effect on the market price or value of any of the issuer's securities. An event is considered a material change when the decision to proceed with the change has been made by the board of directors or other persons acting in a similar capacity or by senior management who believe that confirmation of the decision by the board is probable. Part four of national policy 51201, disclosure standards, provides examples of types of events or information which may be material. For example, a major write down or acquisition of other companies. Hope that answers the question. Thanks, uh, thanks Jennifer. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, Chelsea, there's one here for you, I think. Uh, it says the deadline to respond to a comment letter can be very short and no option to extend was provided. What should we do uh, in that instance? 
Yeah, so we have the deadlines in place to ensure that the CD review process doesn't take too long because we understand that issuers are busy with other activities. So as I had mentioned in our presentation, we are flexible with those deadlines. So if the issuer had contacted the analyst who had sent the letter, we would usually be able to work with them to provide a reasonable extension. Um, we want to make sure that the process isn't causing undue burden, so we usually always do grant some kind of extension. Okay, great. Um, okay, your turn, Chris. Where is Chris? There we go. Um, Chris, how can we tell the market about our potential? Uh, so I guess that this is an issuer. How can we tell the market about our potential while ensuring we're not being overly promotional or making uh, misleading statements? Yeah, thanks, Denise. And um, yeah, thank you for the question. So good practice when making disclosure uh, regarding the size of an issuer's industry and potential market share uh, is to include a reference to the appropriate third party source information um, that an investor can corroborate. Disclosure should also clearly state what your current market potential is in relation to the overall industry, um, considering your size and your stage of development, um, and the material factors and assumptions used to support the current addressable market should be included as well. Um, in certain cases, the current addressable market is significantly less than the overall market, and we would likely question the relevance of such disclosures. Okay, thanks, Chris. So there's a question for me asking about whether the presentation and materials will be available uh, in the future. And uh, the answer is yes. So past presentations, you should be able to find them on our website um, under, I think there's a section called uh, news and then it says events and presentations. And so all of the um, prior presentations uh, should be there, including this one. And our communications team says they'll send out uh, an alert when this one has been posted. So that will be available. I think there is another question for Chelsea. Okay, it says, uh, Chelsea, you said that a risk-based review will also look at corporate presentations on an issuer's website or look at other public disclosures made on social media. Why do you look at those? Yeah, so that's a good question. We look at voluntarily filed documents to ensure that the information presented is consistent with what is filed in the required filings on CDAR. And we do often see forward-looking information being disclosed in corporate presentations. And National Instrument 51102 states that the disclosure requirements for forward-looking information apply to information that is disclosed by an issuer. So any FLI that is included in a corporate presentation is actually subject to those disclosure requirements as well. In other instances, such as the climate change and sustainability disclosures, we'll review those types of documents to ensure consistency with the information that's being provided in the documents that are filed on CDAR as well. That's a good point on the, the forward-looking information. I think sometimes people forget that the, the liability, the statutory liability, the ability for investors to sue you can apply to those um, documents, even if they're not filed uh, with us. So, yeah. okay. Um, it looks like we have another one here for... Jennifer, um, what information is allowed to be redacted in a material contract? That's a good one. Thanks, Denise. Um, information in a material contract may be omitted or marked unreadable. If an executive officer reasonably believes that disclosure of that provision would be seriously prejudicial to the interests of the reporting issuer or would violate certain confidentiality provisions. With that being said, there are some disclosures that are not allowed to be redacted. These include debt covenants and ratios in financing or credit agreements, events of default or other terms relating to the termination of a contract, or other terms necessary to understand the contract. And, and what do you see usually? How do people redact that? Are you seeing like a blacked out document? What, what are they sending you? That's usually what I see is they've, they've blacked things out. Okay. okay, Chris, um, there's one here for you. Um, 
we reversed a prior period impairment loss as the pricing environment significantly improved in our most recent reserve report. Why does the ASC require such extensive disclosure on other inputs and assumptions? Yeah, thanks, Denise. Um, so the disclosure requirements when reversing an impairment loss are derived from IAS 36. Uh, our expectation is that issuers will meet the relevant IFRS requirements in their continuous disclosure filings. Um, when reversing an impairment loss, there are a number of inputs to be considered beyond just the commodity prices. Um, there's discount rates, abandonment and reclamation costs, changes any future development plans and inflation. I muted myself there. Okay. Uh, okay. There's one more here for Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, uh, is disclosure regarding how an issuer intends to address its environmental, social, or governance uh, issues? Do, do we consider that to be forward looking information? Yeah, we would if the information contains disclosure that regards possible events, conditions, or financial performance that's based on assumptions about the future economic conditions and the courses of action, then it would meet the definition of forward-looking information and the disclosures for that are required. So the assumptions and the risk factors. And yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Don't know. I'm just looking to see if there's any more questions. Oh, um, uh, okay. So I think that might be all we have right now that's in the chat showing up. So we'll come back uh, and we'll hear the regulatory updates. So Anthony Potter will give us sort of an overview of the regulatory updates. Then we'll hear from our innovation and finance team, Tanya Fleming and Meg Hiles on sort of a teaser on the uh, self-certified investor exemption and how it can be used by co public companies. And then we'll have the um, uh, sort of the CDAR Plus uh, onboarding information, which uh, we hope uh, people are getting ready for that. Uh, we'll hear from that team, from Jonathan Taylor, Brenda Davis, and our guest speaker, uh, Helen Walsh.